Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for our webinar on assessing high risk AI systems under the EU AI Act. So this webinar is part of our International Data and Privacy AI webinar series. My name is Kirsten Whitfield and I'm a partner in Field Fisher's technology and data team. I'm based in the UK. Paul, over to you. Hi everyone, I am Paul Lenoir. I am also part of the technology and data privacy team, and I work in the Silicon Valley in, in, in California, USA. Thanks everybody for joining or listening in on the recording. My name is Thor Sneela. I'm a partner of the tech and data team in our Hamburg office in Germany. Right then, so let's kick off with an easy question. Will AI replace lawyers? And I'm gonna start with answering my own question. So I don't actually think that AI will completely replace lawyers. I think there's actually going to be a lot of stuff that AI can do that we lawyers do, but there are things that we lawyers do that AI won't be able to do. Um, and particularly, I think lawyers are not just about um, telling people what the law is. We're there to help with risk assessments. And a lot of that is based on sort of complex assessment of uh, you know experience, circumstances in real time. Um, and actually, I don't think that AI is going to be able to do that. Um, so, Paul, what do you think? Will AI replace lawyers? You know, I absolutely agree with you. You know, the analysis of the context, the circumstances and so forth, you know, that's going to be something which is uh, key. But even for other areas, you know, like drafting or and, and, and so forth, you know, you know, it may be tempting at first, you know, to say, oh, I can just get an AI to, to do the drafting and so forth. But then it does miss as well, you know, this context, like you mentioned. And uh, we've seen so many different cases as well, you know, in the uh, in, in, in litigation and so forth involving uh, uh, you know, issues in relation to, uh, uh, you know, cases which have been uh, invented by the AI or, or uh, you know, ever in drafting and so forth. So I don't think it's going to replace lawyers, uh, you know, in the near future. Mm. And Torsten, what do you think? Thanks both, both for starting off with this. I guess I actually agree on the nuances. However, um, I might also um, start off maybe a bit provocatively by saying, yes, it will replace lawyers. However, not completely, of course. So that's where I agree with the both of you. Um, so I think there will be areas, let's say commodities, maybe automizable work or semi-automizable work where um, actually AI will replace us. So what we have to do is what we always have to do. And actually what every profession or almost every profession will have to do is to evolve you know, and, and keep at the front of developments. And that way we can keep our profession. Indeed. Thank you, Torsten. So before we dive into our uh, webinar today, I just want to give you a reminder that this is part of an AI webinar series. So the first in the series was the debunking of the EU AI Act. And we heard from Oliver, Olivier and Eva, who are based in our Germany and Belgium offices. Uh, the second in the series was Generative AI, and we heard from Mark, Richard, Andrea and Pardeep, who are from our Silicon Valley office. And this is today's webinar on high-risk AI systems. Um, and then following this, there will be another one on AI governance, and you're going to hear from Carlos and Kira, who are from our, our Spain and Ireland offices. So what are we going to be taking a look at today? Um, well, we're going to be looking at the definition of AI systems under the EU AI Act, just as a reminder. And as we've got Paul with us today, we thought it would be good to have a look at how it compares with the California definition of AI. We're going to look at how AI systems are classified um, and how it gets classified as a high-risk AI system. Then we're going to look at how you might be able to move it out of the high risk category. We'll have a look at some use cases um, and then we'll be looking at um, who are all the different players involved um, and, and uh, looking at some of the key obligations on those players when it comes to high risk AI systems. Um, and then finally, we'll have a little look at um, documenting your assessment. And with that, um, and I'm going to hand over to Paul, and hopefully at the end, by the way, everyone, there will be time um, for question if all runs to plan and runs to time. Um, 
and uh, I have a few questions of my own as well that I'm going to be asking. Uh, okay then, so um, in the deep part of the topic, you know, what is exactly an AI system under the EU AI Act? And you know, the definition of AI is of course an important discussion point as it really determines the scope and the future proofness of any legislation that purports to regulate the use of AI across industry sectors. It's you know, likely a dynamic concept that will likely evolve over time. And you know, what is interesting to note here is that the definition of an artificial system in the EU AI Act aligns nicely with internationally recognized criteria following the OECD guidelines, which defines an AI system as a machine-based system that for explicit or implicit objectives infers from the input it receives how to generate outputs such as predictions, content, recommendations or decisions that influence physical or virtual environments. So you can see that uh, uh, in on the slide that, that uh, the definition in the EU AI Act seems to align in, you know, very nicely with that. Uh, I've aligned, sorry, I've, I've uh, underlined in this slide deck as well, uh, uh, you know, the key, the four key criteria, varying levels of autonomy, explicit or implicit objectives, the outputs and the influencing physical or virtual environments because those are the uh, uh, in, you know the key criteria for the uh, EU AI Act. If we uh, you know if we look at what's happening internationally, so you have draft regulations from the California Privacy Protection Agency, uh, and what is interesting is that they also have a definition of uh, artificial intelligence, which does pick up as well, you know, the, the, the criteria which I mentioned uh, earlier. So you can see that, uh, uh, you know, those are underlined on the slide, the influencing physical or virtual environments. You have that as well, you know, in California, uh, you have the uh, explicit or implicit objectives, the outputs, uh, the levels of, sorry, the varying levels of autonomy and adaptiveness. So we have that as well. So the California definition of AI does seem to be very similar to what we have in the EU AI Act. Now, before some of you start to panic and say, oh, well, wait a minute, why does California have a definition of AI? Do we have a, an uh, AI Act like uh, like what we have in the EU for, for California? And no, uh, so I'm, I'm mentioning this because in the draft regulations from the California Privacy Protection Agency uh, relating to risk assessments, well, there is this definition of uh, AI which pops up because uh, uh, there is this requirement that whenever a business whose processing of personal information presents risk to privacy, uh, you will need to conduct a risk assessment before you can conduct that uh, uh, processing. And they have AI, which is uh, uh, you know mentioned in that context. So the the requirement that you have under the uh, uh, the, the California regulations relate to the uh, to the need to uh, to conduct uh, risk assessment. So risk assessment in California is the equivalent to uh, the, e the data protection impact assessment that we would be doing from an EU perspective. Um, and what is also, uh, quite uh, uh, important to note as well from this draft regulations is that uh, there will be a requirement to submit annually th those risk assessments as well to the California Privacy Protection Agency. So that means that uh, there will be someone actually looking at, uh, uh, you know, what you put into the, those risk assessments. It won't just go into a drawer somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone will be looking into it and uh, and they may be asking questions as a result. Uh, yeah. Um, so if we, um, you know, if we move on to the next uh, slide, classifications of AI systems under the EU AI Act. So you have in the uh, EU AI Act four different risk levels for AI systems. You have the first category, which is the unacceptable risk. So those are the prohibited AI systems. You have as well high risk AI systems, which are the most regulated systems allowed in the EU market. You have limited risk uh, AI systems, which include AI systems where there is you know, potential a risk of uh, manipulation or deceit. And then you have as well uh, uh, areas where, uh, you know, there is minimal or no risk. So the, cl the classification that you, uh, you know, that you see here is important because uh, there are different regulations and requirements for each class. Uh, 
Uh, so now I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, uh, to Torsten, I believe, to, to discuss uh, the classification in the prohibited AI systems. Thank you, Paul. So what we're looking at here is um, this bracket of prohibited AI system, as it says. Why is this important? Um, essentially, you don't want to end up here. That's why. You know, they're not part of high risk. Uh, you simply can't do them. So whatever you do, whether it's high risk or not, while you're assessing, don't end up here. That's the message, I guess. If we look at some of these examples, I think it will become clear quite quickly that this is an area of policy making. This is a political decision in Europe not to allow to do these things with AI. Facial recognition maybe is a contentious one because it's already happening, and maybe even a lot in some countries, even though um, for law enforcement, but also other purposes. But there's other things like social scoring on the top right, as you'll see, or exploiting um, vulnerabilities, which, you know, clearly from the phrasing of it, it's entirely clear that this is something to the detriment of individuals' rights. And one big portion of the EOAI Act is protecting individuals and their rights and freedoms in Europe. So do give it a, a look in Article 5 and don't do these. You can't end up doing them uh, whatever you assess which we'll be discussing on the next couple of slides, um, you, you can't have as an outcome to be doing this, at least not in Europe. So, Paul, maybe we can look at the next slide and actually go into the high-risk area with that. What you see here is the letter of the law. Don't worry, I'm not going to read this out to you. You, you can read it the law and you will have in the past. It does come with a disclaimer, which I have to add first. I bet that many of you will have seen yesterday's news that actually a new, allegedly final draft of the AI Act was leaked, this time from the European Parliament. So I have not included language from that because quite frankly, I haven't digested everything from it. And also it's not entirely clear to me where all of the changes are to be made. What I can say is that for Article 6, but also 5 and 7 and around and many other areas, there are actual changes. It looks like many of those changes are either welcome because they clarify certain things or they tidy up the language or the structure. Um, they tidy up paragraphs, they rearrange things, but also there's a couple of things where something is um, edited to some extent substantially. One thing I can mention is that there's an area of high risk um, AI assessments where this might have slipped into Article 6. It's not entirely clear to me, frankly, how or whether it's redundant, but we'll pick it up on the next slide, what you actually have to do. And the idea of the assessment and the criteria, I think, will remain the same. My last note on this latest leak is that, personally, I think we'll see um, probably at least one more tidying up action. There's still lots of numbering, for instance, that needs to be aligned um, to get rid of all those sub-articles and sub-paragraphs we're still seeing in these leaked drafts. What you can actually see now in terms of content on this slide is on the top right. It's reference from Article 6, one, is where this references out to other parts of legislation. And importantly, it's referencing out to annexes two and three, which you can see here. These are really essential. They're key to your assessment, your review, and your outcome, whether you actually do high-risk AI or not. So the idea is the letter of the law, the, the statute itself, at the top in Article 6, paragraphs 1 and 2 mostly, they do not spell out everything for you. And I'd say conveniently, these annexes 2 and 3, again, which we'll pick up on the next slides, do some of the work for you and they can be amended in future. I'll go into that as well on the following slides. The whole idea is, uh, and I think it's worth noting, that we are probably in an area of um, product safety, legislation on product safety, because from Article 611, you can see that it refers to products or safety components of a product, which have to be the actual AI system that you're discussing and reviewing. That's where AI, the AI kicks in. It wants you to assess that product or safety component of a product, whether it's safe to use in Europe. 
that's the idea. That's why I call it safety, product safety regulation. And with it comes also product liability. What you see on this slide is an attempt to um, sort out some of the clutter of the language and put it into a structure here, which I've tried and, and maybe you agree that this is a bit more easy to assess at the first glance. So whatever you see on, the, on this slide here, the three areas ends up being high risk AI systems. On the left, we have article 6.1, which, as I said, return, refers to products and safety components of products, and also then the search in NX2. We'll see that in a moment. And then in the middle column here, there's NX3, which we'll also go into, which um, references out to other areas in the law that in Europe are going to be regulated in AI systems. And on the right, um, you'll see a dotted line. Why is that? Why did I use a dotted line and also on the left? The reason is that this is what I call an exemption from an exemption. For this slide, maybe it's enough to keep in mind, if you do profiling, and this is actually the GDPR sense of profiling, about people with the data you use for your AI system, then this will also be high risk. So again, a policy decision in Europe. Paul, can you show us the next slide? As I advertised, this is a slide on NX2. What you see here is lots of pieces of legislation already existing in Europe. On the left-hand side, it's actually part one or section A of NX2 in the AI Act. And on the right-hand side, it's part two or section B of NX2 in the AI Act. Is, as I will put it, um, legislation existing on the safety of humans, this can also refer to medical devices or in vitro diagnostic medical devices. It can also relate to heavy industry. You'll see agriculture, marine equipment, you'll see vehicles, you'll see a rail system on here. So this is my attempt at putting in a box on the bottom right, sort of a bracket of what, what this is all about, this legislative framework and other harmonization legislation in the EU. So again, I would stress this is product safety related. And there are requirements and standardization elsewhere in the law. And these are the directives and regulations in EU law. And that's where the intersection comes to play with safety regulations. So if you have to make um, a conformity assessment on these products in these areas of product safety, then this is also high risk AI in the EU AI Act. It sounds fairly straightforward. However, um, there's a, a couple more things in there. To me, um, it's probably a bit more straightforward than NX3, which we'll go through in a moment. Um, I'd say if you work in these industries, in these areas um, of operations or businesses or business models, then you should look carefully whether you're already called by the existing frameworks and legislations. And if you are, then you should definitely look Take a closer look whenever you're employing AI systems because there, there's a higher chance simply of also being caught by the AI as act high risk areas. All right. Next slide, Paul. So what I'm proposing here is and I'm putting this under the headline of moving out of the high risk category. Why did I do that? My idea was um, most of you, or at least many among you and everybody else out there providing services and products or employing AI internally in your organization, will think about why do I have to look into this? Why should I care? And, and if I'm caught, what does this actually mean? And to me, there are sort of two angles to look at whether you will actually be caught by the EU AI Act. One is the scope itself. And for Article 6 of the AI Act, you should mostly look at annexes 2 and 3, whether you're caught by those, because then you will also be caught by these high-risk AI obligations in the AI Act. And then you'll have to do, you know, um, probably go through all your obligations, or at least make sure that your provider of the system, if you're not providing that yourself, is actually compliant with the AI Act. The other one is on the timeline. Keep in mind 
there's a tranched, a staged approach to the obligations in the AI Act. So if you fall within the scope of Annex 2 of the AI Act in Article 6, then the, the applicability of that is delayed by 36 months, three years after the entry into force of the AI Act, which will hopefully or possibly see very soon. So you have three more years to prepare for that, unless, of course, um, you'll be caught by the other option, which is the next three of Article 6. Then you'll probably have to start right away. And also, I'd say keep in mind, it will take time. If you actually build your own AI, whether as a product externally or internally in your organization, you will need time, your product teams will need time to build in this legislation and its requirements. All right, next slide, Paul. So again, this is a technical slide. I wanted it to put in uh, to put it in here. If you look at it, this is Article um, Six Two as it goes on, with exemptions. You know, this is Paragraph Two A at the moment. I hope this will be tidied up. Actually, in the final published piece of legislation, it does refer to Annex Three only, as I explained on the previous slide. The exemption is if your system does not pose a significant risk to individuals, this is all about risk to individuals, then you can get out of scope. That's why the exemption. And one of the areas where you can try to do that is by not materially influencing the outcome of decision making. Decision -making. So a heavy focus on decision making, because that's what AI is going to be used a lot for, decision making. The idea is then, also in paragraph two of article six to go on to define criteria. I show, I'll show them on the next slide, again, trying to rearrange them visually. So no need to look at them right now, but the idea is the same, no significant risk and or not influencing decision-making. And what I want to mention here, which is also going to be on the next slide, is there's also an exemption from the exemption. So very technical, very legal, um, the piece of legislation here in article six to a, um, keep in mind, you, you can be called again with this exemption from the exemption. But, but Paul, can you please show us the next slide so we can try to, to have this tidied up visually? Again, this is my attempt. What you'll see on the left is Article 6, Paragraph 2a, that I've just shown to you on the previous slide, how to get out of applicability under Annex 3. And on the top, right, you'll see four areas that are list, listed actually in the piece of legislation that give you ideas how you'll not be caught. This is the exemption. On the bottom right, you'll see the exemption from the exemption. If you do prompt filing, again, in the GDPR sense, you'll be caught back by the scope. It will be high risk AI after all. I hope that's clear. Maybe let's move to the next slide. This is where we're looking at uh, further obligations. We don't have to spend a lot of time. Actually, this is being rearranged by this very new leak from the European Parliament. We saw, at least I saw published yesterday. Um, don't get too used to the numbering, but I think the ideas, the substance will remain. There will be additional requirements like documentation, specification, and criteria on uh, where you're not materially influencing decision-making. Or can you show us the next slide? This is where we're going into Annex 3. So if you think you do this, then uh, you're a good candidate for actually conducting high risk AI uh, processing. If you look at this slide, this is sort of the private sector part, as I think of it, of Annex 3. Um, there's biometric identification, as the first one on the top left, which um, again aligns with Article 5, the prohibited area, the biometric piece. You'll recognize that. The second one is critical infrastructure. So there's maybe overlap with product safety and liability in the sense of maybe NIST network um, and information system security. So you, you'll have to look into that if you're sort of a crucial provider and a critical infrastructure provider. And the third one, third line here is education and vocational training, and we'll have a use case in the sphere of HR later on. What I do want to mention on the bottom right side is this box again, 
that the Commission will have the power to provide delegated acts to actually adapt this annex. So you'll have to constantly monitor developments in the law. And there's numerous criteria, actually, um, why and, and how and for what reasons or under which requirements the Commission is allowed to provide these delegated acts to, uh, to amend Annex 3. If you want, you can take a look at those criteria here in Article 7, because I think they'll give you a very good idea for your high-risk AI assessments. And I'd use, frankly, the same kinds of criteria and reasoning why you do high-risk AI um, processing or not. All right, on, on the next slide, um, the last bit of Annex 3, this is more public sector. So I, I guess most of you in the audience will not be caught, unless, of course, your public sector, especially law enforcement, monitoring there. There's migration here, administration and justice. Just keep in mind, if you're caught because your customer base is public sector and you have an AI system that you sell to public sector customers, you will also be caught indirectly and have a look at these use cases in the recitals. And I think with that, I'll hand back over as this is the end of my part. Thank you. Thanks, Torsten. So I'm going to have a look at a few use cases. Um, and this is just my trying to work through what we've seen so far in these, these various um, drafts of the legislation and apply it. I'm very much hoping, and I'm, I'm, we've heard and we've read that there will be um, examples and guidance to guide us all through um, an understanding of what does fall within the high risk bucket and what doesn't. Um, but here goes, here's, here's me working it through. Um, and I think if you're a user of the um, of these high risk AI systems, um, you will want to understand that it is high risk. You, you hopefully will already know that it's high risk by virtue of being categorized as such by the provider. Um, but I think you will definitely want to be checking for yourself that it's been correctly categorized um, and also understand if it's high risk, what your obligations are. And we're gonna hear more from Paul on that later. Um, I think the other reason that you'll want to also be um, sort of checking um, out the different use cases and understanding which bucket your AI falls into is um, even if you know it's categorized um, as, as high risk, what you don't want is to find that actually it should have maybe been a prohibited AI and someone's miscategorized it and you find yourself using prohibited AI. So um, you still will have lots to look out for as a user yourself. Um, Okay, so here goes. Um, what about email spam filters? Well, I, my reading of this um, would be that um, this, this could be AI that is looking at incoming um, traffic. So it's not necessarily monitoring the traffic of my workers, so it doesn't automatically fall into the workers high risk bucket. So that could, as long as there's no um, sort of material risk of harm or infringement of people's rights and freedoms, um, that I think could potentially just be, let's call it low risk. Um, what about if you've designed a really great advert um, and it's going to scare people into buying your product because um, for fear of losing out or for fear of what might happen? Um, now, this quite possibly, I think, would fall into the prohibited bucket. Um, so the reason for that is that um, you're not allowed to essentially influence people's cognitive behavior. That's that's completely prohibited if, it, if there's a negative um, impact. Um, weirdly, also, um, you're not allowed to be flashing up subliminal messages. I'm not sure who does that anymore, um, or even whether that has an actual <laughs> real effect on people, um, but you're not allowed to do that either. So that would fall into the prohibited bucket. Um, what about systems to evaluate creditworthiness? Well, um, I think that would be high risk that's mentioned in the recitals um, of the act um, and i think when you think about it this is going to have quite a material influence on people this this determines whether they actually can or can't potentially borrow money um, so 
there could be a significant harm to individuals if, if that all goes wrong. So you can see why that would be categorised as high risk. And also, it would probably um, involve some profiling, I would think, um, and, and in which case you wouldn't be able to move it out of the high risk bucket. Um, facial recognition entry systems. Um, now, you might think automatically that that is high risk. But actually, if all you're doing is um, comparing uh, sort of uh, facial features against a, a database that you hold of those facial features, um, that might not actually be high risk, I don't think. I think what the legislation is really trying to protect against is um, sort of use of biometrics in public spaces, um, use of biometrics to identify individuals rather than the, the individual themselves, for example, using it to gain entry to a building or gain entry to their phone or what have you. Um, automated scoring of exams. Now, that is particularly called out as a high risk system. Um, so basically, whenever you're evaluating learning outcomes, they say that should be treated as high risk. Um, and I can't see that you would ever move that out of the high risk bucket either, because of course, if things go wrong there, the AI gets it wrong, um, that could have lifelong impact on, on people that were taking the exams. So if we just move on to the next slide, please, Paul. And I'm gonna have a chat about um, em the employment sphere. Well, the if it's any use of AI in the employment space, then actually it's going to automatically fall into the high risk bucket. So then what we're going to have is um, for pri providers to uh, decategorize it, um, they're going to have to look at the exemptions um, that we were talking about. Um, now, I think actually for a lot of these things, it's going to be quite difficult to move yourself into the exemptions. Um, but personally, I think actually there's a lot of overlap with the GDPR here as well, which is um, basically a lot of regulators are quite mindful of the um, data protection regulators, are mindful of the imbalance of power between the employer and the employee. And I expect that some of that has had an influence on categorizing these types of AI uses in the employment context as high risk. Um, so what if, for example, you're doing CV triaging um, so in the in the recruitment space? Well, that potentially could have a big impact of individuals so if they don't get through to interview, so I don't think I'd be able to decategorize that. Um, inclusion and diversity monitoring, um, that would automatically be high risk by virtue of the fact that it's in the employment space, potentially here. Um, however, I do wonder whether there might be an argument for decategorizing that one. Um, I mean, you might be wondering why I'm saying that, because of course, this is potentially special category personal data, which has higher protections under the data protection law. But actually, my, when I was thinking this through, uh, to me, this is, if you're doing an inclusion and diversity monitoring, you're not doing it um, uh, usually in a way that's gonna cause harm to, to individuals. Um, usually you're doing surveys, you're collecting and analyzing data and aggregating it. And it's actually for, um, for the good of your workers. So I do wonder whether there might be um, some way of, uh, <laughs> moving that one down down the risk register. Um, employee coaching with a chat bot, um, I, I think possibly you might be able to de-risk that one as well. Um, because It depends on what you're coaching them on, of course, but if it's a, um, it might be just helping them with prompting for answers that they might otherwise, have, to do their work, which they might otherwise have needed to go up and, and look up in a policy document. So that could potentially be quite, low risk um, to the individual. Um, emotional recognition systems for use within interviews. Now, um, now, it's not that common that employers will use emotional recognition systems, but um, there have been instances of it. And I remember reading a, a, year, a couple of years ago about this um, in the newspapers where, say, in job interviews, people's um, faces were being filmed and you could um, 
uh, basically tell all sorts of things about that person from that video and you can see how AI might be then used to um, recognize emotions and decide well would this for example would this person make a good call center person you know do they come across um, in our view as um, happy and polite and accommodating and actually you, you might have similar sort of um, analysis going on for on performance of your call center um, people now those sorts of emotional recognition systems um, uh, I think you're probably going to find they'll fall into the uh, prohibited bucket um, so we won't want to do that we move on to the next slide please and I'm handing over to Paul thank you very much uh, yeah, so you can see here on the, on the slider, you can see the uh, you know variety of different uh, actors uh, uh, you know who are involved in in relation to the EU AI Act. So uh, you have different obligations as well, and depending on you know which category uh, you know the organisation, the entity fits in. So the, uh, in the the first category, the providers, so that is any person or ent entity that develops an AI system or general purpose AI model or that has an AI system uh, or a general purpose AI model developed and places them on the market or puts them into service. So whenever you put something into, into the market, you put it into service, well, you may be classified a provider. The second category, the deployer, that is any personal entity that uses an AI system under its authority, except where the AI system is used in the course of a personal, non-professional activity. Uh, the other categories, I think they are, they are a bit more obvious. You have authorized representatives, which is any personal entity which is based, established in, in the EU, who has re received a written mandate from a provider. You have an importer, which is any person uh, or entity uh, located in the EU that places on the market an AI system that bears uh, the name or trademark of a person or entity established outside of the EU. And then you have a distributor who is any personal entity uh, in the supply chain that makes an AI system available on the market. Uh, so you have you know, those different categories. And you know, as I mentioned, the classification is important because you have different obligations depending on which category you fit in. For example, if you are a provider, you have uh, the uh, you, you have the, the different obligations which are listed here in one, in a one to four. Uh, the first category, the first pillar, if I can put it that way, would be assessment and registration. So you have to register on the EU database for high-risk AI systems. You have to ensure that the high-risk AI system undergoes the relevant conformity assessment procedure. And you have to affix the uh, CE marking as well onto the, the system to indicate conformity. The second pillar would be risk management and human oversight. So uh, there needs to be a risk uh, management system to monitor the AI system, uh, which needs to, uh, to develop as well as the understanding of the AI system develops. There needs to be, uh, it, it needs to be designed and developed in such a way that it can be effectively overseen by natural persons. Uh, and if there is any reason to believe that the AI system is non-conforming, then you will need to take the necessary corrective actions to bring the system into conformity or withdraw the system. The third pillar, data governance and security. Uh, you, you will need to make sure that uh, you have appropriate measures in place to, uh, to ensure security. So that includes uh, prioritizing and design robustness and cybersecurity. Uh, you will need to make sure that any data gaps can be identified, that you have measures in place to detect and prevent possible biases. Uh, and, and you know, really make sure that uh, the data input is relevant in view of the uh, intended purpose of the high-risk AI system. The fourth and last pillar for, uh, for providers would be having in place technical documentation, record keeping and transparency. So this means that you need to have a, a comprehensible documentation kept allowing compliance assessments you will need to have and retain automatic logs uh, and then also a, a sufficiently transparent uh, documentation to enable deployers to interpret the system's output and to use it appropriately. So those are the uh, obligations in relation to uh, uh, in, in, in providers. And 
I mentioned earlier, you have other uh, you have other categories. You have, uh, deployers as well. They have obligations in relation to uh, uh, assessment. Uh, they will need to conduct a data protection impact assessment for the use of the system. Uh, deployers also need to make sure that uh, uh, they use the system in accordance with the terms of use. They comply with the EU uh, EU requirements and with the instructions of use. Uh, deployers also need to make sure that, uh, uh, that they retain automatic logs as well. And then, uh, yeah, distributors, different obligations, assessment uh, and registration, they need to, uh, the distributor is required to verify uh, the CE conformity. Uh, if the distributor believes that the system is not uh, in conformity, it, it will need to take the necessary corrective actions or inform other entities in the AI supply chain. Uh, they will need to make sure as well that uh, the storage or the transport of the system does not jeopardize its compliance and um, yeah, provide authorities with necessary documentation detailing activities. And then uh, importers, importers are required of course to verify the CE conformity. Uh, importers uh, will also need to make sure that uh, uh, in, if the system is believed to not be in conformity, they will need to take, uh, in, you know, just like for distributors, they will need to make sure that uh, uh, they take the necessary corrective actions or inform other parties in the AI supply chain uh, and then provide authorities with necessary documentation, keep relevant documentation for 10 years, uh, indicate name and contact details on the packaging uh, and um, re uh, retain accompanying documentation. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe just, you know, very quickly as well, authorized representatives, uh, you know, same, they have to verify uh, the appropriate conformity assessment procedure has been carried out by the provider. They will need to make sure that uh, uh, they perform the task specified in the mandate from the provider. Uh, they will need to be able to provide a copy of the mandate to the competent national authority. They will need to, uh, uh, keep the provider's contact details, the declaration of conformity and the technical documentation so that they can provide those to the, uh, the, the, the relevant national authority. Uh, so, you know, those were, you know, in a nutshell, the key uh, obligations in, in relation to each of the different uh, categories uh, that, we, uh, that we have under the EU AI Act. So, uh, oh, so I actually did, uh, um, I think you've so, I think you've covered a lot of it already, Paul. So. Yeah, I've, I've I've did those already, so that's why I, I, I skipped through those because I went through those very quickly because I'm conscious of time. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, in, in, you know now I guess uh, you know I'll pass it on to you to discuss uh, how you can document the assessment. Yeah. So um, so we've just given you a little very quick snapshot here of um, how we are documenting AI assessments. Um, now, why are we doing that already? Well, I think the the, the powers that be, the regulators, would like to see, um, even before the legislation comes into force, um, entities thinking about AI systems and starting to do assessments anyway. Um, but of course, there's already um, requirements to of, of a type um, for an assessment, the data protection impact assessment, if there's personal data involved. And in a lot of cases, um, when using AI systems, there will be. So there's overlap anyway. Um, so this is why we are seeing clients already starting to do, uh, I guess what we, I would call them an AI DPIA. Um, and that was a snapshot of our AI DPIA there. So if we move on to the next slide. Now, I think we do have time for questions. Um, yes, we do, and I'm going to dive in actually because I had a, um, a question. I'm going to fire this one at Torsten. Um, and Torsten, can you just um, expand a bit because I think people that are listening in will be probably thinking about this and have this, have this on their minds. How does this, the AI requirements, overlap with your GDPR requirements? Yeah, thanks, Torsten. Um, to I guess to anybody who's a privacy profession who has worked in GDPR or other regions or pieces of legislation, this actually forces itself upon us because this high risk area, we know that absolutely from privacy legislation like GDPR. 
So um, I guess the short answer is, um, I think there'll be lots of congruency or at least um, same principles and idea. You will have to conduct similar types of assessments. And you've already shown us um, the screenshot earlier, Kirsten, on the previous slide. So this is something you'll have to use to put together and then actually think about whether you want to do it all in one go, you know, like your AI Act um, high risk assessment together with an Article 35 DPIA under GDPR. I guess it will depend on the complexity, whether you can do it all in one document or whether you want to split it up and also how good the facts are that your product team or whoever's doing or planning to do AI is feeding you. But then absolutely, you will have to, I think, have the same kind of mindset with your assessment of high risk. And then, of course, also follow on questions. What happens if it still remains high risk in GDPR? Then you may have to go to prior consultation, which you, I guess, generally want to avoid. Um, th those are all areas you have to think about. And also, uh, I believe on deployers, in line with what Paul said earlier about obligations, if you conduct high risk AI, then uh, you'll also have to put uh, carry out a DPIA anyways under Article uh, 13. That's where it's regulated in the AI Act. So there are these interrelations also like profiling, as I mentioned earlier on my slides. This is the GDPR notion. There are absolutely overlaps. So it's not just product and safety and liability regulation. It's also very close to protecting individuals' privacy and those principles we know. Thanks, Torsten. Yeah, and I noticed that that even um, you know some of the the terminology they they literally cross refer to the GDPR, don't they? So very closely aligning the uh, the, the terminology and some of the concepts. Um, and I'm going to also dive in with a question for Paul because I, I I did think that maybe some people might have this question on their minds anyway, which is. Um, so we've heard a little bit earlier, Paul, from you about what's going on in California from an AI perspective. If I've done an EU AI assessment, does that mean I don't need to do another one for California because um, it will cover it? Uh, you know, that's um, not exactly accurate. You know, of course, you can rely, uh, you know, the big chunk of the analysis that you've done from an EU perspective because uh, uh, you know the risk criteria and so forth. You know uh, there are similarities, of course, but then you would uh, you know need to uh, revisit uh, you know your, your your assessment to make sure that you take into account California specificities. Uh, there is uh, you know by way of example in California there is a lot of focus on uh, uh, you know disclosures in relation, for example, to selling or sharing information and so forth and then you have different uh, uh, it, you know the, the the areas of risk as well are slightly different in California so I'm not saying that you cannot use the same documentation you could if you adapt it uh, and you know include the California specificities in which case you would be able to then have one single piece of uh, uh, document um, and you know one, uh, one other point that I want to mention as well is earlier I mentioned a few times you know it's a draft regulation and uh, we have had those uh, different versions of the draft regulations. The latest one that I was uh, pointing at earlier were from the 8th of March, uh, following the, uh, the the meeting from the California Privacy Protection Agency. The draft is not yet finalized, so there is, of course, still the possibility that uh, uh, in, in the coming weeks or months that there will be uh, additional uh, tweaks uh, and, and changes made to those regulations. So it's not yet a requirement uh, but then you know I think that it's important of course you know for us to be mindful of uh, what is very likely to be uh, you know to, to be coming out in the very near uh, near future because uh, the uh, you know the different uh, versions the different draft regulations uh, they have been tweaking you know of course some elements like the definition of AI system and so forth but then the the requirement like I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, you know conducting this risk assessment in relation to AI systems uh, the, the, the fact that you would need to submit those on an annual basis to the California Privacy Protection Agency, those, of course, you know, uh, uh, you know have remained because those were touched upon already in, in, the, in the text of the law. Well, that's quite interesting about the submission to the, um, the California agencies, actually, Paul, because I um, and presumably um, if you've got different things in your assessment for the EU, you don't necessarily want to be submitting all of that 
to a Californian authority, you might want to have your, your a separate assessment for that that you submit. That's true. Mm -hmm. that, that 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 does make sense. Um, what I meant is that uh, in, you know some organisations prefer to have one single set, uh, but then uh, in, you know for sure uh, uh, other organisations um, you know may want to have uh, you know different documents so that. Uh, uh, you know, they tailor really the, uh, you know, the response to what is needed in California and that there is no misunderstanding because with the, the definitions, you know, the concepts are slightly different in California compared to the EU. So, you know, it is true that if you, uh, if, if you go on, on with the assumption that, you know, we can just use the same wording for everything, then there could be some misunderstanding. Uh, uh, as well, you know, because the, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the, the categories of risk are slightly different and so forth. So you really, need, really need to make sure that uh, uh, you are mindful of those and that you don't end up with, uh, uh, you know, a misunderstanding on the part of the California Privacy Protection Agency in relation to what you're doing. Mm, yeah. Um, so right, let's turn to some questions from the audience. Um, and, and Gus might add a look, but while the two of you were chatting, um, I'd like to pick something up actually, which oh, struck my mind. Um, there was one question about, you know, checking a company's credit worthiness. I, I guess this could be um, broadened to any kind of AI activity. The point that the, the attendee from the audience is making, if you assess the company's credit worthiness as opposed to an individual's, what was also fall within scope. And happy to disclose my thought process. My first point would be, you know, if you can draw inferences from that on individuals, that will still be caught quite clearly in scope. But if, if we push that to the side and it's really just about a company, a legal person, then my initial thought was, well, this ought to be caught, uh, sorry, not to be caught by the act. And I, I had a look because my thinking was that this is about the protection of individuals, as we said in the beginning, and protecting their rights, the fundamental rights in Europe. And I had a look at the um, allegedly final draft from the trial of proceedings that we've been using for the past couple of weeks that was leaked semi-officially. And it's actually not in there with reference to Annex 3, so Article 6, Paragraph 2. And that struck me as odd. So what I did do is I had a quick look at this new uh, uh, draft that was leaked yesterday. And actually, the Parliament did add that part in Article 6.2, which seems to corroborate my position, because it now says that there's this additional requirement on actually assessing risk. So the significant risk of harm to the health, safety, or fundamental rights of natural persons is now in this European Parliament draft. That's why I think my initial gut feeling probably was right. And a bit in so far as it only pertains to companies, not individuals, I think it's out of scope. Um, but we'll see use cases, actually. The Commission is, uh, is empowered to provide assessments and guidance for us on use cases. And as I said earlier, they can also mend an axis. But at the moment, um, I'm happy to stand with that assessment that companies should be out of scope. And I think that's got to be right, actually, Torsten, because um, the the whole the premise that the, the fundamentals that this legislation is sitting on is around protecting human rights, and that sort of the fundamental human rights charter um, that mm. that we have in Europe, um, and also you know. We have, we have similar in the UK as well, but of course this is a bit of European legislation. But um, yeah, so if, if you go right back to that basic principle, um, it would make sense that it would apply for assessing credit worthiness of an actual individual, um, because that could have a significant impact on that individual. But actually, um, there's less of an argument, isn't there? Or, that if you're assessing the credit worthiness of an organisation, um, that there is a harm to uh, any particular individual as a result of that? Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree. Um, my only sort of um, lawyer's disclaimer would be, uh, again, similar to GDPR, do we really have a case of where it's just pertaining to a company? Don't we almost always infer also information about individuals within that company, owning the company, representing the company? A bit like uh, even B2B contact data under GDPR also qualifies as personal data. Hmm. Oh, that's a good 
that's a good point as well. Um, so I think we've got time for another question, and I don't know whether um, Torsten, Paul, either of you want to take this one, but I'm, and I'm going to spring it on you both. Um, so would the EU AI to Act take precedence over the new Cyber Resilience Act? Um, because both of these acts contain provisions relating to high-risk AI. Well, I'm happy for you to try. My, my short answer is, um, unfortunately, you have to keep all of them in mind. You know, like just we said earlier with GDPR, in so far as their scope defines, they will be applicable in parallel. Um, th this is all good news for consultants and lawyers, I guess. But everybody else out there um, trying to come to terms with these different pieces of legislation, it's actually quite complex to um, to converge on these points and find out whether they have different requirements or whether they might actually contradict another. They don't really take precedence. You have to keep all of them in mind, like, like you do, you know, civil law or common law, whichever system you're under, in parallel when you're crafting contracts for your AI products, you will also, of course, have to follow contract law and maybe consumer protection law if it's a B2C or B2B2C um, product. So all of these will in general apply uh, in parallel, I'm afraid. Yeah, and I, I, I think so too, Torsten. And when I was reading the Act, I saw in numerous places mention of, you know, without prejudice to other legislation. So it seems that you've got to just make everything fit together like a very complex puzzle, I think, and comply with everything. Yeah, yeah, without that, actually spelling out uh, those other pieces of legislation, you know, just uh, not preempting them. Absolutely, and you know, the Cyber Resilience Act is more in relation to you know, cyber security, cyber resilience in the EU, and so forth. So, it it, it is you know, slightly different in scope, and that's why uh, you know, like Tosin mentioned, the the obligations in, in in terms of cyber security and so forth. You know, they uh, in, you know they would still apply, uh, you know, uh, regardless of uh, you know the EU AI Act. Uh, uh, you, you cannot just comply with one piece of legislation and uh, and, and you know that's it unfortunately uh, if, uh, yeah it's a piece of a puzzle you have to comply with the different legislations in those cases and there may be other cyber security uh, requirements as well uh, uh, you know I'm thinking about this too uh, and, and 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 so forth you know which will be uh, in, in place soon as well so uh, yeah unfortunately you know different pieces of the puzzle and it means that you have to uh, yeah, the compliance task would mean, uh, you know, understanding the obligations under each of those different uh, uh, pieces of legislation. Yeah, and I know from a security perspective that it's getting, it, it's particularly complex. And I know, um, you know, we've, we've been working with some clients um, who are starting to grapple with this um, this minefield of different security standards and requirements um, and sort of understanding where they overlap, which additional requirements are there, and, and how does that impact what you're doing. So, right, I think that is um, as much time as we have for questions. So, um, please do, if, if we didn't answer your question, uh, or if you've got any questions that you didn't raise, um, please do get in touch with us, and you we're always very happy to have a sort of email conversation or, or pick up the phone to us and we'll have a chat. Um, we will circulate the slides, and some people asked um, if, to everyone that uh, registered. And um, we've actually got a lot of other um, places where you'll be able to find lots of resources. Um, we've got lots of free resources. Um, and I know that it, when I used to be in-house as a data protection officer, and had I known about all of these free resources, I definitely would have been signing up myself. Um, so we have, Field Fisher has its own um, data and privacy web page on YouTube, which you can sign up to, and we make um, most of our webinars available there, and this series will be available there. So if you missed any of the um, earlier webinars in the series, please do um, go and have a look on YouTube. Um, we've got our own Field Fisher team blog, which you can sign up to. Uh, we've also produced as a team an AI regulatory guidebook, which is it's really great. It just gives a, a sort of clear snapshot overview of the, the different developing bits of AI legislation in, in various jurisdictions. Um, and so we're very happy to make that available to you. Um, so and uh, when you get your slides, there will be links within those slides so you can click through to where you'll find all of these resources.
So once again, thank you everybody for joining us. We hope that this was helpful. And as I said, please do get in touch if you've got any questions. Thanks indeed, everyone. Thanks everyone.